All right. Shall we get started? I had this vision of you guys sitting in this room and you guys are all huddled in one little corner. <laughs> yep, it's uh, kind of the case. Uh, actually, the camera might go a bit further back, but it's a little bit de delicately placed. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll buy a tripod. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm kind of I'll happy give a 30-second update to start that we're now up to 60 certified vendors. Uh, rack space just came in, which we were very pleased with this week. Um, which is uh, one of the last major well-known clouds out there um, who had not been offering a hosted service before. So it, it, um, the, the program remains uh, extremely widely uh, used. And um, the two kind of focus areas coming up are we have KubeCon Cloud NativeCon Shanghai in uh, November 14th and 15th, our first ever event in China. And we're definitely going to want to do a, uh, a probably two sessions there, an intro and a deep dive. And so I'm hoping that some folks from this call can join me for that. And then we'll be in Seattle uh, December 11th through 13th. So look for, uh, I'll be sending out an email shortly um, asking folks to sign up for that. But I'm not sure if people now could volunteer that they're interested in, uh, in attending and presenting on the for Shanghai. Um, I can answer any questions, but that's my update. Sounds great. Uh, great news about Rackspace and the 60 providers. Um, maybe, yeah, if you send that email, definitely uh, I'll circulate it around, see if, uh, see if we can get some volunteers. Yeah, Dan, I think you can count at least one person from IBM and we'll be able to be there. Great. Yeah, at least one among the two of us, if not both, yeah. me and Aish plan to be here. Uh, we're happy yeah. to help in any capacity. Great. Okay, uh, thanks for the update, Dan. Uh, with that, I guess, uh, let's go through the agenda. Um, so, uh, on the top of the list is the conformance testing guidelines. Yeah. Um, is that me? Okay. Oh, I'm not, yeah. Um, I don't know who, so, I just wanted to give a good, uh, quick um, update of what we've been up to since the last um, meeting. Um, so, one of the PRs I've linked um, there is the conformance guidelines. So we've been formalizing some of the guidelines, um, taking the work that Srini Mitra did and, um, and then passing it around with SIGAR to get some of the guidelines as such uh, formalized. So um, the PR is out there if any of you want to take a look and comment on it. Uh, we are waiting on SIGAR's approval to actually check it in. Um, so that's one, and the other is, um, as for conformance coverage efforts still, we've been looking at um, two main areas. One is the API machinery and the other is Node. Um, with the aim of identifying a few tests that we can A, promote to conformance in 112, and also some um, areas or CUJs where we can actually start writing into end tests and then promote them after they fare well. Um, so in terms of API machinery, again, I've, I've linked to the tracking bug where there, there are ongoing discussions. Um, feel free to chime in. Um, working with Federico and the um, the SIG API leads here. We, we've identified like six cases to promote to uh, conformance in 112. Um, <clears throat> out of these, we have PRs in flight for three of them already. Um, one of the PRs is uh, we're fixing, we're trying to deflake some test uh, before we can actually promote it. The, um, the other PR is we have a couple of namespace tests that are again waiting on review from SIGAR before we can promote. Um, the next cup, next few, uh, we need some guidelines from this group because one of the features is in beta, which has been identified for promotion. Right. We'll have more discussion on that below. The other um, test that was identified, we already have coverage for that in end to end, but going through the coverage, we found that it doesn't exercise all the scenarios, um, and there is some room to uh, improve, update the test or add new tests there. So again, we are working with the SIG itself for guidance on that. Um, as for Node, um, again, there's, I've, I've linked to the tracker bug. This, this is a much more involved effort than API machinery, considering there's so many endpoints that's touching forward and you're trying to understand the interworking of everything. Um, but main areas that we are focusing on is um, Jen from Node. He shortlisted a prioritized set of APIs for us to look into. And we ran uh, 
API Snoop coverage on um, both the end-to-end -end non confirmance test and the confirmance test to see if we have any Delta E2Es that we can promote. We found that um, the EVICT API endpoint is the one where we have um, we have some end-to-end -end test cases that could that could be candidates for promotion. Um, again, a uh, bunch of those are uh, uh, and in the discussion we found that those APIs in the feature itself is again in beta, so we need some uh, right. guidance on that. And um, Kiri, uh, who was one of our um, global vendors, she went ahead and took uh, took a stab at coming up with some test plan and CUJs for patch API, uh, which is one of the prioritized APIs, to see if um, all of those uh, scenarios are covered or which of those we can promote. So I will link the test plan. We are going to be working with um, more with the, signal, the Node team itself to go through the review the test plan and see if um, any of the scenarios there look good to add to the test cases. So if if you got any of you want to take a look at the test plan and comment there, that will be useful as well. So um, hopefully some of these might come in time for 112 for promotion. Um, we like it possible to have a, you know, not that I want more GitHub teams because I don't, uh, but if would it be possible to have a conformance GitHub team so that way when like something gets promoted, people within this group, a subsection of this group, as well as a subsection of Arch are notified at, at you know, conformance PRs or something like that. So that way it's, it's clear and, and the, the loops in the right people as part of the process. Okay. Um, so right now for those promotion PRs, we are looping in SIG Arch, but um, I, yeah, I can create another team and then okay. um, I would circulate it just to see who wants to get onto the team and then um, I'll make sure the PRs, I mean, it gets added to the PRs. Yeah, because I don't think other people who are part of this group here are visi have visibility besides the SIG Arch folks. So. Okay. There also might be a subsection of SIGARCH that cares a lot versus all of SIGARCH, which might be spammy. Yeah. So this would just be a group like anyone can join uh, just to get notified, just get pings of these issues. Is that yeah. a suggestion? Right. Cool. Um, so that's it for updates from me. Cool. So as you mentioned, I guess twice, uh, there's some like beta implications. Um, so this is something that we wanted to discuss with the group today. Um, currently, we kind of have a process where you know, in, in, now that the program's a little bit more mature, at least, the tests kind of land only once everyone sort of ratifies them and they're deemed like mm -hmm. reasonable for conformance. What we're missing is we're missing a way that beta features can have the performance implications tested. And but we're also missing a way for a test, even of a non-beta feature, to potentially go through a stage where it's like getting evaluated for, con for inclusion and conformance. They're either in or they're out. Uh, so one thing that, that we were talking about um, and actually we raised this probably like, I don't know, a year ago um, as, a, as an option, because I guess like now it's starting to become relevant. Um, you know, maybe we need to start labeling things as like beta conformance and having, it's kind of like, it's not so much a formal profile as it is just a, a group of end-to-end -end tests that people could run for the purposes of A, qualifying beta features and potentially even including tests that are not yet, that are of like GA features, but that are kind of, just to go through like one set, you know, to avoid kind of just landing in GA and like surprising everyone, all of a sudden people are like, oh, I'm not conformant and then it's like a big hassle. If it goes through this beta stage, it's kind of like a canary in a way. People can, people can see if like they're passing the tests like before we promote it. Um, and this would also be helpful, I guess, for projects like Istio that are actually like, you know, and as we look at like KPIX, there are some projects that they're relying on a lot of beta features, which people are deploying into production for better or worse. <laughs> um, so, the beta profile could actually be useful for end users as well, which is like, hey, I'm actually using a whole bunch of beta Kubernetes, um, you know, and I guess at that point, the profile does become a little bit more formal, but um, yeah, what, what do people think about essentially creating a, a beta conformance tag? I, I don't mind adding a tag of some kind to indicate beta features, but I, I put in chat that the, the term beta conformance is an oxymoron. It's like plastic gas or glass or jumbo shrimp. <laughs> Uh, because like the whole purpose of conformance is that these are features you can rely on that are absolutely, yeah. you know, production grade, but the, by, yeah. by definition beta, we are ma not making that guarantee. And we are, we are even saying that we will break or add things in the future. So the guarantees are different. So I don't mm -hmm. mind adding something that says like beta or, or some other. It's kind of like, a, 
it's kind of like a conformance candidate, right? It's not, it's not part of conformance, but it, it's a candidate that, that may become part of conformance. Is that a better way to phrase it then? Sure, but I, I just think the, the term beta conformance is... is... I think... <laughs> <laughs> that was a hilarious point. Pretty uh, The other... I suppose thing. If, you're, if you're building a workload and you want to be portable and you're starting to depend on beta features, you would like to know what cloud providers are conformant Again, again, we should use we should not use the word conformant because we're totally conflating it. I, so, I, I think we're conflating two big themes here too. One is giving uh, providers a heads up as to what have been proposed as conformance tests that are coming uh, to give them an early warning that they need to either push back or make changes. Uh, and the other is a profile that describes what APIs are exposed in a given provider and those well, are two very distinct concepts well there's a third thing here which i thought may have been what the person was asking me in the he's in, he's in the corner i probably don't, don't know your name was the testing of beta features and i thought we weren't doing that well, well we're I, not i guess that's why we're talking about it now <laughs> I, I absolutely love the idea I mean, of a, a tag specifically for beta features i okay. absolutely gets the idea of having a beta conformance tag <laughs> because those two things are mutually exclusive. Yeah. Okay, so can I just get some clarity? Are we talking about a set of conformance tests that are proposed to be conformance tests and that's why they're quote beta or are we actually writing conformance tests for beta features? Well, the, I mean, they're a little bit conflated but that, that I, I guess like we need to address both, both problems. Whether we do that with the same tag or different tags, I think we need to address both problems. Um, so when it comes to beta features, I think it's actually extremely important. Like I would like to suggest maybe as part of your document, like the candidate document that like a feature should not be promoted to GA in Kubernetes anymore without the conformance implications understood. understood. Now, you know, we don't want that just to like drop in there suddenly. So I think like it makes sense that as, as a feature itself is, and like there should even be an alpha, right? So like as the features themselves kind of go through the, the graduation process, like they should be having tests. And that should be a gating function whether or not they graduate. So we need some way to capture that. Now, I don't want to get too caught up on the name, but I think, you know, I also think that that is a way for providers to kind of raise the flag and say, hey, actually, this is a problem for me and have those discussions like as early as possible. Uh, to, to Jago's point there, like we don't, we don't actually want to like drop things on people by surprise. And like, you know, then they might be non-conformant without having the chance to kind of argue the case. So I think that's important. And then, you know, since we have a, have a low coverage situation that we're expanding, that kind of like surprise, here's a new test thing is also happening on GA features. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if those two things deserve two different kind of streams of tags, but I think they're both relevant problems for us to solve. Um, I feel like there is value in having um, results reported in two places. Like we have a conformance test grid, right. but we should probably have some for features that are in beta that we want to make us GA and we have a separate test grid and they should be part of the promotion process. So, yeah. Yeah, I just want to jump in. I hope that we can solve, uh, automate the process of distinguishing those beta yeah. features, those beta EDE tests, which are calling beta APIs, uh, distinguish that in an well, auto. But they're not just EDEs, like, right? They're, they're EDE conformance test candidates as well. So it's like, it's like a subset of the beta EDUIs. But my, my point is maybe calling the same conformance IT method, uh, if it is depending on a beta API, it doesn't get included in the gold list, but it is run as part of the conformance suite and it gives you a separate output. I don't, I'm totally making this up as I talk, but I, I think yeah. where we're going is features that graduate to GA have conformance tests as part of it, we already encourage EDE tests to be written even for beta APIs. So I would hope that we can come to a process by which that's more automated than coming up with a different tag. I think Are that, you saying is that it could be the same tag, but because the underlying API is beta, right. you wouldn't make it into the gold list? That's right. Uh, oh, okay. So that Did could you, be the early signal. Does that work from a process point of view? I think the other part of this problem is the what I would hope is a one time closing the gap of what are currently GA APIs that are not part of the conformance 
sweet. And I don't know today if we expect that to be 100% or not. I, I expect there are some interesting conversations to be had there. Uh, but I think there, that, that's a separate problem maybe where we need a proposed conformance concept where it gives it some bake time and we can have the discussions we need to have as we figure out if it's 100% API coverage that we intend to have. Okay, so what, 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 what other people think? Do, do we wanna create two separate uh, things here to, to handle these, these cases? So I think a label to indicate this is a test of a GA feature and this conformance test is still in the working stages, whether you want to call it beta or whatever you want to call it, that I agree with the label for that. Mm -hmm. The other label, I want to make sure I'm on the same page as you guys. You're talking about a label for a test that almost means the exact same thing as what we just described. It's a, this, form, this conformance test isn't officially uh, approved yet. And it's for a beta feature, which has not gone GA yet, which is why it's obviously beta. Mm -hmm. And hopefully both those things will happen at the same time, meaning the feature will go GA and the conformance test will go quote GA at the same time. And you're looking for a label for that. Is that correct? Yes. The more same less. Time part, I think we've had conversations in the past where we may need to separate those temporarily by a release. But that's well, fine. But, but, so uh, timing is, really? but I mean, I, I would argue that if the feature graduates, the test should graduate with it. Yeah. Yeah. How does so, this so let me make a proposal, if you don't mind, which is that we currently 100% of the conformance tests are we'll called them production conformance tests, so they're GA level. I'd I propose that we create three new categories of tests, of uh, candidate alpha, candidate beta, and candidate GA. And then as um, new features are maturing through the Kubernetes process, the candid test would come along with them and we would be encouraging people to run those in sonability, uh, but uh, none of those candid tests would be required in order to be conformant. But the candid GA ones in particular would be the most important because the assumption would be that those would be coming in very shortly. And that would be reserved for the, uh, uh, this work that we're doing on the backfill. Yeah, I think the point Jago was making was basically based on the structure, the directory structure of the API or something, like we can infer that something is in beta. Right. So we might be, even if, even if we label it as confirm and sit, yeah. based on where the test is located and the structure, we can find out that this is a beta feature. And we might okay. be able to do some smarter qualification automatically. So we might not necessarily need another label. Okay, that, that would only leave us with a label for the GA candidates, I guess. Right. Um, but so I mean, right now we, we, don't, we don't lag the candidates by release, do we? No, Normally, no. not that, no. And we haven't had any problems with that, I guess. I mean, I mean, I guess, would introducing a candidate GA label mean that we can actually like move faster in a way because we, 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 could, we, could, you know, call, we could basically label a whole bunch of tests as candidate and then use like a cycle to get feedback on that rather than would that help us move faster or, or does... um, I mean the test that we have to promote them yeah if we if we identify the the, the blocker that I'm having there is identifying is this a test that's worth to be promoted right and then if we have that input then we can yeah move faster so then no you won't move faster because that input velocity won't change yeah it's that it I'm blocked to getting that input as in like yeah, is and this... that's human human minds right. yeah, human small, but... Um, at least with the whole beta feature, uh, the, the thing that I, the problem at least I'm trying to solve is when do we go to a feature owner in the release cycle and say, do you have conformance test for this or not? It, it sounds to me like we should be doing that right at the beginning. They should be labeled conformance and then the tool automatically, based on the directory, yeah, just says, okay. like, do, does that sound reasonable to everybody? Because it yeah. seems to me like, like it should be an artifact that, that is attached to the feature. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not opposed to doing the automation behind the scenes, but the, the labeling of what we call it, uh, I think over time needs to be clear. But I said uh, in the chat window, why don't we move this to a proposal? Uh, okay. And that way we can actually have a proposal where we're gonna, we're gonna get other people and stakeholders that we're gonna need to solicit 
like yeah. the big testing folks are definitely going to want to be able to set up dashboards for this stuff. So their, yeah. their input matters too. So. Okay. Um, I mean, it's certainly good to have some rough consensus here. So it sounds like we want to be, we want to be making, adding tests to alpha beta features. There's two ways to go, whether it's the same label with, with uh, directory structure or maybe a different label. We, that can, I guess, be left up for discussion based on like the tooling and what's the better approach. The second issue of GA candidates, do we need that or not? Um, Mm, I don't have a specific. Okay. I don't see an immediate need for that, and, and, based and on what I'm blocked on. So currently, currently we're just labeling them, and then how, like, is there is there a risk that someone could, I guess, discover that oh, this, there's a problem with this test, like post release, or I guess it doesn't really matter. We just we can just drop it after the fact if that happens. As in, if the test is flaky, or so, is so not doing what it's when, when we launched the conformance, there was about I forget exactly the count. There were about three tests that got excluded in the end. Because it was like, oh, this, it was either it had a bug. So like, had a bug that kind of like had to be fixed. So we like dropped it from conformance temporarily, but it was like still technically labeled conformance and, and people were still technically failing it. We just said, okay, a failure on this one doesn't exclude you, right? That, there was one that was a bug. There was one that like just got stripped from conformance. It's like, okay, it's, it's labeled conformance, but we're just ignoring it. Um, I'm wondering like, what happens if we graduate, if we like promote an E2E test today and like land, it drops in like 112 and then, you know, let's say a provider wasn't like keeping up today and then like we're, we're checking this ahead of time, which I kind of don't expect them to. And then they're like, whoa, this test is a problem for me. And then maybe we need to like reconsider it. Like, is it, you know, we, yeah. we thought it was something that everyone should be conforming to, but, but there's some contention. Like, do we need to do anything around that? Or is the current I, process? I think what you're saying is we need like dry run of proposed conformance tests. I don't know if we need that. Yeah, I'm wondering if we need that. Uh, it sounds like it hasn't really, I mean, yeah, do you think we need it? <laughs> I think it would be useful. Because uh, we can always drop it after the fact anyway. We can always say, you know, we promoted five tests for 112. Turned out one was, one needs a bit more work, so we're going to, like, ignore the results of it temporarily. Like, that's the other way to do it, isn't it? I, I'd rather not do it that way and then potentially piss off lots of people because uh, right. certainly the non-conformance. I'd rather do it the other way and say, guys, here's a set of conformance tests we're, we're going to add you better darn well run them by this date because this is the testing right. period to make sure everybody's okay with it. So what I was, I think, proposing before as a process to fill this role was to agree by feature freeze for 112 what EDE tests we intended to propose as okay. tests for 112. Yeah. Those EDE tests already exist. And people can already mm -hmm. run them, uh, but this would be a much more visible way to get that feedback. So I, yeah. I agree with the direction, uh, and I think that the trick is always making sure the signal is valuable. Uh, we're not right. just being more complex. So basically, basically you're just saying, like, just tell people a little bit earlier, you know, by the way, you know, we just feature froze. You may want to run the conformance test and let us know if there's any problems in the next, like, few weeks, uh, as opposed to, I mean, the nice thing about that is we avoid, uh, we avoid lagging a version, which is good. Yeah, and the, the distinction here is I think there is a time, a calendar day gap between what features we, what EDE tests we propose to be part of 112 and when those are actually reviewed and approved and added to the gold list and will actually be run as part of the conformance suite. So what you're proposing would put that into the tooling and I think that is an improvement. The, so the, the proposed conformance or coming soon Right. So I guess we have two options here then. Like one is we just, we make a commitment that they're all in by the feature freeze. Mm -hmm. And then we expect providers to test the, you know, pre-release version Kubernetes and report any problems. Otherwise it goes into the release and we can always deal with, you know, just escalations artifact. Or we introduce a process where something gets a flag. So it soaks for a version. Yeah, we, we should be really explicit. My, my earlier Propose the guidance that I was trying to push folks towards was to have the proposed list by feature freeze and right. the list and the actual code committed by code freeze, just like everything else. Oh, okay, right. So code I, not, I was not earlier proposing that we have all uh, approvals and committed and update the gold list by feature freeze. That was oh, I see. what I was suggesting. I'm open to whatever folks think is a good idea, but I was just trying to use the existing gates 
Okay. Totally so so if, if we if if we don't, if I understood you correctly, uh, code freeze <clears throat> is when the test cases would also be sort of frozen, then, right? Yeah. And what if, but what if people don't actually run the test cases to verify they're okay with the conformance test suite until all the code is actually written, which means code freeze. And then we find something wrong with the code. And the, the, in general, the concept of the test is correct, but the code itself has a bug in it. How do we get that in? The, the way Android does this for compatibility, it actually, uh, they have a separate date for, C, uh, for compatibility test freeze, which is very similar to the conformance freeze here. Um, but they have it basically midway between code freeze and uh, feature freeze. <laughs> okay. So, so we, we already have a process by which we do bug fixes between code freeze and the release. Uh, and I would expect this would behave the same way. If there's a bug in the test or there's a big discussion and we realize that it's actually shouldn't be in the conformance suite after all, we all made a mistake. Um, we just make a change and cherry pick it into the release branch. Just I'm, like I'm, yeah, I'm okay with that as well, as long as the people who get to approve uh, those those hot fixes, for lack of a better phrase, understand that even though these are test cases, they are serious enough that they should go around that, or that they should follow that same process, or be allowed in, and not look at it and say, oh, it's just a test case, we don't need to pay attention to it. How do we, yeah, I don't think how that's do we get by on that? From the current process, we make pretty significant changes after the code freeze. Uh, no, I understand. It's just people. Some people may, who may not understand the importance of the conformance test may look at this and just say, "Oh, it's just a test case. We can let it go." It's like, no, I'm sorry. Conformance test is 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 just as serious as something in the mainline product at this point. Okay. So, so how, do, how do how we emphasize that? Do we do we need like a, a document detailing like how we graduate tests? Then um, that would include such a statement, or I'm not sure. yes, I think the kept process is probably the right one for this too. So it sounds like we need a kept for how things get graduated then. Yeah, which but, kind of yeah. also talks about which right. is. Which seems like a fairly lightweight kit, but just as a way to, is that, is that what I'm hearing? Is that what other people think as well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so I guess the action item is two caps. <laughs> but it sounds like, I mean, does anyone object to this direction that, that we're going with these? Um, any, any feedback that we should know and take on board before, before the kit is proposed? Obviously it's better if, as a work group that we kind of have some consensus going into the care process. Um, so we're not arguing amongst ourselves. All right then, um, next topic is API Snoop updates user agent hack. Happy Hicker, <laughs> would you like to take it away? Sure, um, one I wanted to, uh, uh, get some New Zealand culture in here because it's, there's some things about introduction that it's been difficult for me to convey. And I figured with a really short story, it might make more sense. Um, a Marae is where people come together to do social things in New Zealand within the, the Maori context. Um, and when they do so, there's a protocol involved. One of them's the Haka, where there's, you've probably seen it in front of sporting events where the New Zealand All Blacks team will give an invitation to be their best at the, uh, the, the rugby games. Um, and then there's the concept of a waka. And New Zealand was populated not that long ago by people coming in on canoes. And when we get together at a marae or and they do a formal introduction, people will be asked their whaka papa. And what they're asking is, where are you from? What's your history? Why are you here? And they go back if they're Maori, they'll say, I came on this particular canoe these many generations ago, and I came this step and this step and this person. These are all the humans connected to this land, and that's why I'm here today. So keep that in mind. The who they are when they're showing up is important in any context, for, particularly for me. And I, um, when we look at the trying to figure out who we are when we're talking about these API stuff, um, I looked at how do we normally identify when someone's talking to us via HTTP and it's the user agent. So a lot of this is around saying, who are you talking to me about this? Um, so one of the approaches that I took um, was doing um, hacking client go to when the API call is made, creating that fuck -a papa all the way back to main if possible or back to the assembly code where we were in the wait 
So we really know the faka papa for this particular conversation. And when I pull all that data together, it really, I really see some interesting patterns. I don't have those defined yet, but I want to, to, to understand that we, we need it from all applications, if possible, just to say flip, flip a switch. Would you mind telling us what you think your fucker papa is so that we can correlate and provide some really meaningful in-depth um, user stories? Because now I think with this data, we will be able to um, create some data-driven conformance, possibly some automated tests that we see through machine learning or other protocols. Here are the actual patterns that we see over and over again throughout our community. So I said all this to do content because it's been hard. I know that user agent is not necessarily designed in this way. There's some limitations because in the past we presented, hey, that's just supposed to represent the application and maybe its version. But for me, who you are when you're talking to me can mean much more and may need more space. Um, so there's a user agent um, release for us that has a lot of interesting data. It's based on the data, the same uh, structure that we used last time, um, but I don't have a lot of correlation on it yet because I've, it's, it's, it's been a journey to get um, all these pieces together. Um, because it affects so many different pieces within the ecosystem, I think it's gonna be best to create a cap to convey the importance of why we need this. And, and, and uh, I'd love some help in, in the authoring, the editing, the, the definition, uh, so that we can find a really good way, um, I think, to do some stuff in Client Go and to make sure we get it all the way into audit so there's not a necessary a need to upload stuff later. Um, but I'm open to any other options or anything that allows us to you get this level of depth and understanding of our community and what it means to, to as far as the API being a part of it. That, so this is amazing. Yeah. Once <laughs> <laughs> just acknowledge that story. <laughs> I did not see that coming. That was amazing. So help me understand, is this, would this be then, um, so anyone using client go, like just, just kind of users would be, would be then sending that information to their own API servers. Is that, is that what you mean? Well, they, they, yes, um, but in order for us to collect this and make it meaningful, I'm also suggesting we, we provide a way where they can run um, something similar to Sonoboy. And it says, hey, this isn't actually my production environment, but I'm going to do all the stuff I normally do because, man, I want this to be a part of what, what is tested. <laughs> and it just configures a dynamic audit thing, which is another kept that's being worked on, I think, related to this. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have all of that figured out, but it, it, I do want everyone to be able to, to send their, their, as it works within their cluster, or you know, even within our application, I'd love to do it like for all of the Helm charts and for all, and, and find an easy way for people to enable it. Yeah. Easy thought was have to uh, an, uh, enable the fucka papa variable, you know, and, and, and client go picks it up and says, hey, I'm gonna do that thing that I don't do normally, but I'm gonna do the, the, the formal introduction thing. Is it um, about plumbing and like an X trace ID through places where it doesn't, it isn't passed along today? I mean, there's like open trace and so on. Is it a tracing problem that you're getting at or? Uh, I, I don't think, I don't think so. Cause I looked into doing those, those approaches and they, they don't interact well with the um, API, like getting it through the API server itself. They do all the other components. Um, and another thing is wanting to not, ha not, not complicate the, the contribution of this information. I, it feels in some way, if we could find a way to have it just be a, a, a switch they flip on and then they're pointing their audit there. If, there, if, there, if it needs to be more complex, I'd like to see, to, yeah, what, what, what would work. Um, some other options, because it's so long, trying to create, um, instead of the full fucker papa, they're doing a um, hash maybe, and then making client go generate a, a, a hash to the fucker papa list. Just to say five, so. I'm keeping a straight face when you say fuck <laughs> I'll, Sorry, I'll, I'll, I can call it a stack, uh, call no, stack no. or whatever. Like, let, let's find the term that works. But there's a difference. Like, there's the function, the function history. Yeah. You know how we got here from main, and then there's also the per line. And I think that this being able to, for example, in some UI in API Snoop's metadata place, 
going to a particular function and saying, here are all the places in our community that flow through this function. And if we don't make it super easy to contribute to that, we may miss some interesting stories. I'm just trying to lower the barrier to contribution for, for these, this connection. So I guess what I'm trying to figure out is if it's like more like attaching a debugger to a running process or more like plumbing a trace ID through all components in the system. Is it one of those or is it totally different? Um, it's probably more similar to the second. Or no, to the first, because I actually thought about reducing it to, to an ID, like I said. Um, it's for, if you want to look at, if we don't go into all of the per line trace stuff, if we just identified it as a hash and we didn't even translate it, at least we would know this particular API call is coming in for the same reasons. I don't know the reasons. I don't have a lot of metadata around it, but I know it's the exact same fuck up up as this other one. All right? Sorry, that's, I've just had it in my head this whole week trying to get the. No, the, 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 why are you here, right? I don't know the why you're here, but I know it's the same as this person, this other request. So does, 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 does that value change on a per request call? Uh, you're you're saying it stays the same. Or, I'm, well, what you, does the value well, change? Let me, let me paste what one of these looks like. It may, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to copy. There's a link over there to the agent audit data, but I'm going to paste it in the document. So like, this is, woo, it's long and it's in the doc there. But, this is the API snoop or the, the, Wait, the, new, the new stuff. I won't call it. Right, and there's the, this Wait, is. Wait, 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 you said, you're, did you paste something to the chat? I don't know where you're looking. Sorry, I pasted it to the, the document. Where, where would, where, I can, oh. there's, there's the link too. Got it, okay, sorry. Yeah, it, it, there's the function in the file line there. Who, who are you? Tell me, really tell me who you are. And this is on every API request when it's enabled and it's only when it's enabled this is a special very verbose tell me who you are and it were the nice thing is it works for all the applications now so we can get some really interesting data for um like what was this one this is for the, the kube api server so instrument in the kube api server is not really going to be possible in, in a lot of the different approaches that we have unless we just say hey why don't you tell us who you are when you show up Sorry for the anthropomorphization of all of this. It just I'm a people person, and it so, works. So then we, then we can kind of compare different users of the API. So that's kind of the goal, right? And yeah, like I guess any anyone that's Istio would then look like Istio because we would sort of have a way of analyzing that usage. Is that yeah? Sort of and, you, and you're going to encode all the stuff into the user agent field. Is that what you I, said? I, I I did. Oh, you did. Okay. It's not, it's not clean. Like this is a rough. Yeah. Um, if we go, I mean, um, frankly, it's not that much longer than the regular like Mozilla user agent. Yeah, it, there's and Spegno is like 12k, like in Microsoft, you know, the, the the communication stuff. So there's lots of headers that can be much longer. We just have to agree as a community: is it okay to tell us this much information in this header? I mean, it and should then, definitely be like opt in, I guess, right? Say again? Yeah, well, definitely opt in. This is not a default. Yeah. And then, yeah, is it okay that? use a variable or something where it doesn't change the user experience from client go to turn it on. What would be nice if we have those things is just to say, hey, here's a kubectl apply that uh, initializes a, um, uh, what do they call the initializer? And it just sets the variable for all of your pods. So when they come on, it's all enabled. And when you provision your cluster, uh, go ahead and make sure you set that variable in your provisioning so that everything community-wide, all of a sudden, if they want to, and they take the special steps to enable it, provides us with uh, this thing, the API snoop. We can call it API snoop or something else. But uh, I'm fascinated in processing, not uh, agreeing <laughs> the direction. <laughs> Uh, and I'm trying to figure out what is what is uh, a near term ask? Is it just sanity check? Is it a specific request for API machinery to instrument some aspect that would enable you to get more information here? Is what I think that the, the um, sanity check and can we get a kept to say let's increase the field? The ask is I need the field to be enabled. 
um, across the community by you know the next release or something so that we can start all the binaries compiled after that point we can go ahead and run automation start collecting um, meaningful automated data-driven conformance user stories from everybody and it, you don't necessarily have to participate but, we, but we can do this first time when you, say, when you say collect is, is it just writing to a long file I mean um, like how, how do we actually collect it audit logs Okay, so pe people people who who run the uh, API server would share their auto logs with us, or yeah, I, just I would say if, uh, an easy way would to say configure a dynamic audit log and point to the centralized thing, and it could be like Sonoboy. We say here's a new um, collector just for for your data, and then they send the data through. We do whatever, and 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 now that's one of the data sets. Yep, that, that, that's actually what we were planning on doing with the dynamic. Uh, audit configuration anyways. It was going to be part of that it was uh, a yeah. we, we call it's a master worker paradigm. We call it the aggregator. So if you just spin up another piece of the aggregator to do this, then it makes perfect sense. Cool. So you're gonna write the client code. Sorry. No, I was just, I just, I'm not against doing this. I'm just more curious more than anything else. I, I, I understand that we wanted to get some sort of uh, for lack of a better phrase, tracing through the API server to see what bits of code we're hitting to make sure we get good coverage and stuff. Um, so what does this information provide for you? Because this is information about more or less the client side, right? So how are we going to use this information going forward? So one of the things that I'm, I'm seeing is uh, when we're, I think if we put, I haven't seen the patterns yet because I'm just getting to where I have all this data in, in, a, in a single set. Um, but being able to not just identify endpoints that need coverage, that's, that's kind of a metal thing, and, and not just identify tests, current tests that, oh, I guess it actually would be kind of a uh, test that are getting, sorry, they're called normal tests that are not promoted yet. Really good data there for the, for the, for is the current test doing what we're, what the community is doing. Um, and then when we're starting to write a new component or a new test, going and looking at those similar programs and their line of code where, where they're starting and saying, oh, look, this is the flow of the, of the, the, the logic through here. And here's a, an auto-generated set of, of, of what a, a user story, user, user story might look like generated. We, don't, we just start off looking at that and saying, is that okay? And we can use the type of expert system style to start you know, making the, the, the machine learning or the algorithm work better to auto generate meaningful stories that are always going to be approved by a human. But I think having these, that that's the goal, I guess, for this data is to provide a way um, for data driven um, user stories to, to come forth that we might not have even seen before. It's definitely about, and, and I think to do so, we do need some type of, of trace of, of, uh, who, who, why are they here? And, and why are they here in a very specific, and I think this is the, the shortest and concise form that provides us that level of, um, of clarity. Could, okay. could we pair this effort with a debuggability effort where uh, maybe there's other motivations to possibly turn this flag on, such that like, oh, well, I'm having weird issues and I wanna turn this on so I can provide an audible log to send up to some cloud provider, like, um, I wonder if there's an additional use case here for, for this. Yeah, yeah, no, I suspect there, there will be, not just for the, for the, the data, but maybe, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like a stack trace uh, when it croaks or, <laughs> uh, the other thing I think would be useful uh, is to figure out what are we testing by accident through the existing conformance tests. Uh, mm -hmm. I suspect there are derivative APIs that are getting called sort of unintentionally or, mm -hmm. Uh, that would be really useful to understand as well. I, I did. I don't uh, have it in this data set, quick, but I, that was the goal. Is to, sorry. Just a quick one check. Uh, we need to move on to Michelle very shortly. Um, do, you have any, do you have any last thoughts? Uh, like one or two minutes? Um, please participate in the CAP if, if possible. Um, that would really help to, to, to continue the conversation outside of what we have here. Um, did you share a link or, or will you? I did. Will you it's, the kept, it, it's, it's a Google Doc for pre PR, but once once we get uh, a consensus and I have sponsorship by the right, I think I have to have some SIGs and some. It, it's put, if you fill out the top area well, 
the, the between the two little dashes. I uh -huh. think that'll provide enough context for um, the rest of the conversation. And I think the cap can be put forward with just the first two sections filled out. Cool. So the call to action uh, right now is review the draft cap. Yep. And um, if you're interested with that data, I really would love to work with people to, to make that data meaningful. I think there's, there's really nuggets of, of gold in there. Okay. So review the cap and think of other use cases and uh, share them mm -hmm. with you. Cool. Thank you. Very exciting. Okay. Uh, Michelle, are you on the call? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, cool. Um, so I've started looking at um, ways that we can add um, the persistent volumes into conformance suites. Um, the main challenge we have is with the persistent volumes layer, it requires a vendor specific volume plugin um, in order to really test the full functionality. Um, so I believe there is this concept or maybe, I don't think it's an official concept, but I think there's an idea of having profile conformance suites um, with these sort of um, more optional features. Um, so at least um, for sure, I think we'll want to add quite a few tests into this uh, profile suite um, that can, you know, test both control plane and data path for using volumes. Um, the main question I had right now is, is there value to having a core conformance suite for volumes that doesn't actually test um, a vendor specific driver? Like it just tests a mock driver and it tests that the control plane calls are being made. Um, the, that would basically ensure that distributions are running all of the necessary controllers to be able to run uh, volume plugins, but it doesn't actually test something that a user would experience. Okay, so two topics there, one is uh, should we start thinking about profiles since we have some t conformance tests that, that not everyone can pass? And the second one is, do we add kind of abstracted tests into the base conformance suite? Is that roughly correct? I'm, I, I kind of want, this is the first time I thought about this, so forgive me if it, if it doesn't come out quite right, but I, I kind of question the value of testing just to make sure the controllers themselves are running. It, I'm wondering how much value that really is. Yeah, that's that's kind of my concern too. Um, because from a user perspective, just because the controllers run doesn't actually mean a volume plugin will actually work. Yeah, yeah. So I, I and I know that there's been some pushback in the past on on testing specific plugins themselves or extensibility features like this, but that's really what people want, unfortunately. Uh, the one from a little bit of functionality that says, you know, if I provision a volume, regardless of what volume plugin I have, I'm going to get a volume, um, as opposed to something completely different, like a network. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, I guess my thoughts are uh, it, it t testing against uh, effectively a, a, a reference or a fake is more useful as smoke tests or end-to-end -end tests that make sure that the conformance test will pass if they make sense and sort of good for gating and protecting those other tests, but not conformance tests themselves. Yeah. Just a uh, quick question, just a clarification. This is uh, Deepak Vish from Huawei. So profile, when you say profile, is that the same thing, you know, the certification, the uh, uh, the profile certification, like the way one time we were thinking about multi-tenancy profile, or is that fall in the yeah. same category? Because if that's the case, this will be too granular though. There'll be explosion of these kind of profiles. Isn't it? Right, so, so yeah, so I think the second point here is, is that, yes. Um, and Brian Grant did send, send some feedback this morning uh, where he said kind of a similar vein is a, a view that, you know, let's not get too granular. So then it becomes a question of, do we want to create like a dynamic, profile where some of these things go. 
Yeah, because I think that that's what I thought. I know there was another discussion going on, the snapshotting, volume snapshotting. So these, I'm just giving one example. So that way you can have like thousands of these kind of profiles. So that'll be, that'll be kind of confusing. Well, yeah, I, think I, think, there, I think there's general roll up level of snapshotting or sorry, general roll up level of features that are provider specific. Like you could, you could have an entire category. If you lump them into larger categories, the number of categories you have is finite, right? It's not, but I think the, I think defining the categories and the behavioral level of testing is key. So like storage as a lump sum for all of storage features makes perfect sense. Getting into the minutia of, 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 or getting further down the tree into the minutia of X or Y becomes not beneficial. Um, and people basically want to ensure that they, uh, for storage capabilities, that features are supported across providers. And that yeah. is a good thing to test that they need to have tested. Yeah. And the, well, the extra challenge with storage is that we there are various types of storage so like we have single writer storage and multi-writer storage and those are going to have different um end user behaviors and some vo volume plugins might support snap snapshots and others might not so having just storage as one lump sum profile um might limit the number of features that we could end up including in the suite. You could you could always categorize it and break down the tree by by major features, right? Like storage is a lump sum, and then feature enablement is the other thing because not all storage providers will have all features enabled. That's correct. Yeah, and I think the important thing to an end user is matching their workload to a capable provider that has the feature that's required. Yeah, right. but I guess so in terms of like conformance, like would, would we just have a storage profile and then providers can check mark that, but then you have to drill down deeper to actually see which features each plugin will support? I, I think you have to have a list of features that you can consider to be conformant. And then features that are outside of that list, uh, you know, are features that can be tested, uh, but they're not part of the conformance list. And then eventually there had to be a graduation. Does that make sense? Because that you're saying there's some basic level, some base bar is what, what conformance typically mm -hmm. is. And that we say that if you meet this base bar, you are conformant. But to, you, we absolutely have that extra test that people can use to verify that, that features that they may depend upon exist and are and are working properly and to, to jago's comment i think that the user benefit here is that it means that if you code an application to that bar that only needs the features below that bar then you'll know it will work everywhere that's kind of what we're aiming for i guess no i think the, the the thing i'm kind of concerned and kind of confused about is if you have a storage as a profile then you can have so many permutation combinations for example the device plugin thing each device has its own plugin so would we have all of these permutation combinations in that profile though? I mean, that's what I'm- No, no, we, we, we would provide the behavioral level tests and then set the minimum bar. Okay. okay. And as long as the minimum bar, like the permutations and combinations of configurations that people will have, they can, that can be NP hard. All we're saying is that the tests pass at this bar. Okay, okay. So some kind of a higher level of abstraction of testing basically. Yeah, it's, it's all behavioral. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, that makes sense. So I think um, as a summary, we can start looking into um, what kind of behaviors um, can meet the minimum bar for a storage profile. Um, we can still have optional tests for other optional features, but those won't be required to pass the conformance suite. Yep. And I, I think two things. One, I think we had general consensus here, at least, uh, that testing the controllers uh, that don't actually do anything is not useful to the conformance suite as it's currently defined. I think that's a reasonable position. Uh, and just wanted to make sure we captured that because I'm sure other groups will have a similar question. 
Um, so, so essentially that test just goes into the profile then rather than the, the call. Yep. Uh, but I did want to make the distinction. I think the, the con, uh, conformance for storage as part of the default profile doesn't need its own additional profile. I don't think we need the conformance suite plus a storage profile. Like this is just base profile for storage, just like we have base profile for API machinery and base profile for node. This this would just be part of the existing conformance test suite for storage, right? Yeah, but are you are you saying that all providers have to provide some storage capability? I think I would look to SIG storage to come to a proposal on that and defer to SIG architecture to agree or disagree with that. Um. I think there's layers. I do think there's a separation. I, I hear what you're saying, Yano, but uh, there's um, some providers may not wish to have that profile just for maybe security concerns, right? They don't want to allow workloads to be run on their environment that have storage capabilities, right? Uh, maybe it's for whatever reason, we could we consider feature X or feature Y for these different things. And they might explicitly shut them off or have a different um, uh, different things, but then that guarantees certain API level behavior sure. will be supported, right? So that way, if that way, you have the separation there for major features that are extensible. Okay, uh, that's fine. So the base profile does not include storage, and that would be for like stateless workloads only. And then you have a storage profile or badge or something that gets added to the conformance. Okay, um, so we're about out of time. Uh, it sounds like, I mean, any, any tests that we can include in the base conformance profile, like we, we should if, it, if it's appropriate, but it sounds like we're gonna proceed with the initial creation of a, of a storage conformance label, which would map to the storage profile, is that? Yeah, I think that sounds good. And I can start um, thinking about what tests, you know, planning what tests and stuff can be included in that base storage profile. Cool. I, I'm Michelle, just a quick uh, question. I, I think this feature is not there yet in, in 111 though, isn't it? The dynamic uh, volume provisioning thing is- No, it is. It is? Because I think one of our guys working with you, I think he mentioned that he got pushed to 112. No? Oh, so that's uh, that's related to topology. I just mean today, I mean, we have we have had dynamic provisioning since, I don't know, 1514 or 15 or something like that. Huh. Okay, so maybe I need to, because I'm kind of confused. Because that's what he mentioned. There was something that didn't get... Uh, yeah, there's there's some work going on to make the dynamic provisioning smarter. Okay. Um, but actually, the base dynamic provisioning concept has already been there. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So just in our last minute, I wanted to propose that we review the meeting time as it now conflicts with SIG architecture meeting time, which is... Yes, uh, there will be a doodle uh, forthcoming uh, to select a new time, um, I guess, I guess SIG arc. It's party. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if it, maybe nobody cares and uh, and we can figure that out too. Um, but go, I mean, going back and yeah, that I mean, I was I was starting to attend some of those cigar ones personally. I, I'd like the option at least. I, I imagine other people are, are similar. Yeah, I have to. So yeah. right, you have to. There you go. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you for joining this one today, Tim. We'll we'll find a new time. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Oh. Cool. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye now.